What is your name? Achai Kani Pulikni Pikni Tishinikasi. I'm same now, okay, wait. Okay. Uh, where is your birthplace? And the kitchen at Tao Yan, her skin at Tao. What is your given family name? Um, not to steal. A gona, a gona, mawa, jaykish, and a cassia, not to steal. But he had to get there to settle in this in a castle. No, where do you live? Uta, Uta, get a skin and a conscious lake. What are some of your family members? The five of Jamie, Jamie Sarah, the mama, Maga Janet, West Katsuki Matteo, Ashiki Matteo, and the to the spirit world, Kitteo. But I have my brothers and sisters, my older brother, Miss Des, Ricky Sarah, and Miss Eta Sarah, or Eta Moore. Because it's kind of now James, Albert, Archie, uh, to, to serve my nieces and nephews. And my younger Nishimak, um, Daniel, the C. What's your personal story from your experience in the community? Um. I left, I was born and raised here. I left our community in 1979. That's when I graduated from high school. And I went to college, Seneca College in 1979. And I graduated there in 1981. And I've been in and out from our community since that time. And I, I, to, I worked in Conscious Lake for a while, for about four or five years. I was the recreation uh, director. I was a resource development officer. And my main goal was to look after my mental accounts. Uh, I used to go to sportsman shows in the States, Toronto, filling up the camps. And then after that, I worked with the uh, welfare office for about five or six years. But during that time I went to, I went back to a university. I went to uh, Lakehead University in uh, Thunder Bay. And then I left, then after I came back, we cleared and left again to the city. Um, I went back to school where I, I went to um, Centennial College to computer programming. But Computers were not for me, so so. While while there, I went to uh, I went I went to go work at the Native Canadian Center of Toronto, and I spent ten years there. Then uh, while there, I also went to uh, I went to, to uh, Church, Church Barn College. And this uh, this school is no longer there. Is uh, I forget the name of the school, but it's 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 a computer uh, science and nursing school, and that's where I got my personal support worker. Yeah, as I as I carried on carried on in, in life, there there are changes that we make to make to have us uh, that. Like when I worked at Native Canadian Service in Toronto, I worked with seniors, but I had no training in my education background on seniors. So I went back to school. How to work? Uh, how to work with seniors? So I went back as a personal support worker. So, so I, I did that, and then. Then when I changed my jobs and I work I work for the homeless people in Toronto. And I had no training there too, so I went back to school again as a community service worker because I needed that. Because I never know didn't really know what I do. I guess I could say I had poor guidance. 
so to, so there is the I like to stress if you have a guidance counselor at school go see a guidance counselor <laughs> otherwise it will be like me jumping jumping to different things and, you know, I was fortunate in a way where I got I got my training uh, but uh, to where I where I am at now you know I find language very very important and uh, I grew up not speaking my language. My parents spoke Cree, but they didn't speak Cree to us. They spoke Cree to other people. Consequently, what happened is kind of that we got ashamed to speak our language because that guess that's the subliminal message. It was given to us by our parents not speaking Greek to us, you know. And um, so, to, so to this day, when I speak Greek, well, not anymore, but say five, ten years ago, when I spoke Greek, I, I felt kind of ashamed, embarrassed to speak it. That, remember, that's what I thought back then. I don't think of that anymore. But I asked my parent, I was talking about my parent, uh, James Sutherland. Do you remember him? He was the guy who was in the wheelchair. Uh, he used to go on reserves and saying hello to him. And that's my Kona uh, Nipaba. That's my dad. And uh, I asked him one time, but why didn't you, why didn't you speak to us in Cree? You know, now I understand, but I, for some reason, I can't, I can't I have trouble speaking it. And, he, and then he said, "You know what? Back then, this was in nineteen sixties, uh, early seventies. He says back then, we thought that was the best thing for you guys to learn." Not to, because we thought learning your creed and learning English, and you were already, I was already, we were forced to take French at that time, and they thought it was too much for us young people, because we had to learn three languages growing up. But then they took French off and switched to Cree. But uh, so they, and, and they said, and we thought it would be better for you guys if you guys go out into the world. You don't have to speak Cree out there, you know. And that's what they thought was good for us. In reality, uh, the reason why I was questioning my dad was because Because of their actions, by not speaking Greek to us, it made me lose and have low self-esteem, low self-confidence, because I felt our language was not worth speaking. But you know what? No. Our language is worth speaking 100%. No. Don't ever let anybody deny you that your language is not worth speaking. It is 100% worth speaking. Your language is who you are as a person. It is your identity. It is your culture. If you get, if you know your language, It's deep within our traditions. Everything that we do uh, is within our land and its resources. Our language is based on that. And our land and resources is who we are as a people. You know? um, but back then, with, in, with my dad's uh, 
with my dad's uh, knowledge. You know, I don't blame them. It's it's not just my dad. It's my dad's brothers. It's my dad's sisters. They too can teach their children or can speak to their children the Cree language. Then the more I thought about it, my cousins were also in the same boat. Their parents didn't speak to them in Cree, but their parents spoke to other people in Cree, but not to their kids. So you, have, so you get people my age, I'm 58 now, people between say 50 uh, and over say 65, that age category, we understand our creed, but we have trouble speaking it. Um, only because we were told that, we were taught that speaking our language is no good for us. You know? And we kind of have that message in the back of our head, uh, subconsciously. And, but uh, th that's, that's where I am now with, uh, with my, on my personal story. Uh, so what am I doing to try to alleviate that problem? Uh, I, I wrote a little proposal because I went to school all these years. And, I've learned how to write, so I've learned how to, when I was in college, I took a proposal writing course at my community service worker in Toronto, George Brown College. But while there, I, I took a proposal writing course, so I put my skills that I learned and said, how am I, how am I going to write, I'm going to write a little proposal to the government to access some money, so we will will put a conversational Cree class will offer it in our community for those people that like me that can understand Cree but that have trouble speaking it. So we'll so we'll have a place for people in my age category uh, to speak it more frequently, to have a place. Because if, if you look at it now, you look at the school, you go to our meetings, you go to our general meetings, you go to workshops, conferences, everything that you do is in English. You don't hear Cree in our community anymore. The only place I used to hear Cree is during our church service. One of our elders in church used to speak Cree all the time. And that's the only place I heard. And, and, and I was saying, well, that's not good. We, we, need, we need more Cree-speaking people in our community. Uh, we need more Cree-speaking people that, that, that will be proud to speak our language. You know? So I'm trying to increase the number of Cree speaking people in our community. Uh, but I'm trying to increase the number of Cree speaking people that can speak with confidence. That will speak loudly. I will speak proudly our Cree language. And um, and that's that's where I'm at now. I like that question. Very good. Uh, what is important for the community? What is important for the community? Uh, I I would say language. Only because uh, it, only well, per, that that's my personal. Uh, Feelings. There's a lot of things that are important for our community. Uh, 
I all I already explained language. So um, I find language, and I find a big thing that support for community is our school. You know, we have to have a sound, a strong sound. Uh, flexible educational facility. Uh, we have to get more of our missionaries Mashkikwak into our into our educational system. It's just to help to help our, our youth. That's an, that's another one that's really important is our youth because <coughs> that that's our backbone. We have to transfer whatever information that we have now to our youth. Give them a good foundation so when they go out into the world, they will go out into the world with confidence and say. I could do this. Being a lawyer, being a medical doctor, being an astronaut, piece of cake, I could do this. You know, we want to build that confidence in the world when they go out into the world. And that's what I think that's our most valuable resource is our youth. Um, what advice can you give youth today regarding education and re preserving culture at the same time? You know what? We had Eagles Earth. Eagles Earth was considered a cultural facility. It's a beautiful facility. I, I love it. Every time I go there, it brings me immense pride and joy. Yeah. And, and because, I guess, because of this, that facility is designed as an, as a, it's a cultural facility, but it's also designed as a tourist facility. Uh, because of this distance from our community, it's kind of, it's here, but it's not here at the same time. So, but what we need is a cultural facility in our community. Something like Eagles Earth, like they have the main facility, right? We have the power ground. But I think we have the campground, but we need the campground around the power ground. So when we have visitors, you know, just camp around the power ground. And we have, uh, and we have, say, the sacred fire building, you know, rather than have it set out, out outside in the open, you know, put it in a, in a facility. Have a place for our sweat lodge, you know. Have a place so we could hold fast and ceremonies, but have those facilities no. near our community. I don't know where yet. Actually, we're looking around now because the reason I said because Eagles Eagles Earth is perfect, but it's no longer a cultural facility. It is now a detox center, and I I think will be will eventually become a treatment center. See, so, but I would I would prefer to to remain as a cultural facility, you know, sort of like sort of sort of like a museum. When I grew up, I used to see um, long strings of uh, rabbit 
rabbit fur hanging from people's houses. I used to see more stretch, you know, people working on moons, and I used to see beaver stretches hanging outside. Um, I used to see grandmothers and grandfathers, say grandfathers making snowshoes. Grandmothers uh, making moccasins. They used to make them not just to sell, but to wear on a daily basis. And they used to wear their moccasins on a daily basis. And my grand and I used to see grandparents go walking to the bush to get their wood. And they used to pull sleds and travel by and they used to make uh, travel by dog team. I remember because I traveled by dog team. I remember traveling by dog team, going to the track grounds, say for, for a month, month or two. Do we see those now? Nothing. <coughs> what do we see now? It's sad. No. Uh, did you did you know at one time that in the states they they created a museum thinking that the indigenous people of North America were going to go extinct. At that time, the indigenous population went down to 250,000 people in the States. And for your information, that was also the same thing with Canada. Our population was 250,000. And I remember it being 250,000 when I was younger. And I remember thinking, I think it was in grade 7 thinking, Oh good, our population is now 300,000. No. So, see, the reason why I said museum is because they thought we were going to disappear. But today, with the cultural facility that we hope to develop in our community, that we create our own museum where we will, or we will have a well, we will uh, make our own snowshoes. We're getting more snow every year. Right? This year, lots of snow. Having snowshoes would have been awesome. Yeah. Moccasins, high tanning, moccasin making. You know, we could put those. I'm I'm also taking not not a long line of our generation or your generation, but your kids, kids, you know, we got to think about them. They're not born yet. They're considering a commitment to this world. So we have to prepare for, for them also. I'm thinking about four or five generations down the road. In our culture, we talk about seven generations ahead. We plan for those children. Your great, great, great grandchildren. Those are the people we're planning for. Not us. We know what we need. We got to plan for them. And of course, well, for us also, to regain our culture, regain our identity to keep our identity. So we so we remain proud of who we are, what we are all about. The Great Spirit put us here. God put us here. God made us who we are. And And going against God is not our way, but we go with God. If God made me a native person, I want to be a native person. I want those teachings. 
of a native person. Because if I don't accept that, to me, that's like slapping God in the face. Why did you make me this way? And my goodness, I never want to slap God in the face. Whoever wants to do that, not me. Anybody else could, but not me. I respect. I have respect and I want to show respect. Okay.